I notice a change in about 90% of my patients within the first four weeks. And that is exactly why I wrote this book. I wanted people to get that change. And since I've written the book, all of the feedback I have gotten is the same. People are sending me pictures of their weight loss. They're posting them online. They're telling me how they finally have energy, all this. I get emails every single day, you know, stories, the same story over and over how different they feel. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. Today is the day that we discuss thyroid health. And this is such an important topic to get into One, I have personally struggled with thyroid issues, and there are millions of women out there who are trying to figure out what is going on with their thyroid. Now, I've invited a very special guest, Dr. Becky Campbell, the author of the best-selling book, The 30-Day Thyroid Reset Plan. And what I love most about Dr. Becky Campbell is how simple she makes taking care of our thyroid, especially if we are experiencing an underactive thyroid, which was my scenario. Now, before we jump into how to reset your thyroid with Dr. Becky Campbell, I just want to take a little moment and I want to invite you to reach out to me and let me know what has been some of your biggest takeaways so far on the podcast. For me, there have been so many, but I really love to hear from you to know what exactly you're looking for and how I can continue to provide the best content for you. So as you listen to this particular episode on thyroid health with Dr. Becky Campbell, we would love to hear about how this episode impacted you on your wellness journey. Now, since I started the podcast several months ago, I have received hundreds of emails and messages on Instagram and Facebook from incredible women like yourself who are adopting the advice and recommendations shared on these episodes. I am beyond moved and grateful to hear from you. I actually want to take a moment and shout out a couple of my amazing attendees today. So thank you so much, Holly Bertone and Jaden Furtado, for recently reviewing the podcast on iTunes. I am so grateful that you guys are both loving the show. I want to quickly share a little bit about what Holly said in her quick review on iTunes. Here she is. Oh my God, I feel like nobody understands my journey, but Dr. Marisa gets me. I know there are millions of people listening to her podcast, but it's like she is talking to me. Well, and you. So personable, so informative, love her. Well, I am talking to you today, Holly. Thank you so much for the shout out. I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad that you're getting so much out from the podcast. I really do want you guys to feel like I am in your shoes. You know that I've had some big time struggles in my life. And so often when I'm interviewing these experts, not only is it for really making sure that I get that information for you, but also how I can incorporate it later on to serve you down the road. So I would love the opportunity to shout you out as well. So please feel free to reach out to me via Insta, maybe a direct message on Facebook, or simply review the podcast on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you plug into. That way I can not only continue to support you, but even more women who are ready to become the CEO of their own health. Now that I had the opportunity to do a little shout out, let's dive into this incredible conversation with Dr. Becky Campbell. But first, I want to sing her praises. Dr. Becky Campbell is a board-certified doctor of natural medicine who was initially introduced to functional medicine as a patient. She struggled with many of her own issues, and she finds that a lot of her patients have struggled with the same things. And she has made it her mission to help patients all around the world with her virtual practice. Now, she is the founder of drbeckycampbell.com and the author of the 30-Day Thyroid Reset Plan, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And let me tell you, that book is amazing. But she specializes in thyroid disease, autoimmune disease, and histamine intolerance. And her job or her mission is to help people regain function in their life through natural medicine. 
Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Dr. Becky Campbell. How are you doing today, girl? I'm good. How are you doing? I am doing great. And I am especially thrilled to have you on because we're going to be talking about thyroid health. And we're going to be specifically talking about your book today, which I'm so excited about, by the way. Those recipes in your book, delicious. We already are making some recipes out of that book. I'm so happy to hear that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, since we are talking specifically about how to reset the thyroid, how to support the thyroid today, I would love to just kind of start with your story. You know, this is such a big topic, but it's such a necessary conversation to have. And I am so grateful that you have decided to get on this path to really support predominantly women, I'm guessing, in this journey. But what brought you into thyroid health? So I was suffering. I mean, I started gaining, you know, I gained about 30 pounds and I really never had a weight issue before. So, and it was very quick that I started to gain this weight and I was working out really hard and, you know, eating a pretty healthy diet at this point. And my hair started falling out, a lot of hair loss was actually happening. And I was just really tired, like not getting to my classes, really, really affecting my life at Uh, you know, the level of fatigue I was having. And I started, you know, searching for the answer by going to different types of doctors and no one knew what was wrong. And it was a very limited blood panel they would perform on me and say, no, you're fine. And, you know, it was just getting worse and worse. And I knew that I wasn't fine. I knew that there was something wrong, but I couldn't get anyone to take me seriously. And then it got to the point of being prescribed antidepressants, which obviously wasn't what I needed. That's not, wasn't going to fix the issue. So I just didn't feel heard and I didn't feel cared about at all. And so I heard about functional medicine and this was not very big like it is now back then. And I actually found a center that did all functional medicine. So I went there and got some very thorough testing done And they found out that I did have a thyroid issue. They did a full thyroid panel. And in addition to just finding out I had a thyroid issue, they started looking to see what was driving it. So, you know, with a lot of different testing and different protocols, I got completely better. And I knew that I had to learn this myself and help other people the same way that I was helped. I'm so glad you shared your story. So in that moment, when you're trying to figure out what was going on and you're getting a lot of the misinformation, can you tell me a little bit about what did that feel like as a patient? You know, so many people in the throes of the, of the system right now getting misdiagnosed, especially around thyroid. Tell me a little bit about that journey as well. I just felt hopeless. You know, I felt like no one was listening to me. It was a couple of minutes I was getting to even talk with the doctor and literally could tell that they weren't listening or caring about what I was saying. Of course, this isn't the case with all doctors, but it's just was my experience. And nobody, even like my friends and family, they didn't really understand either. Because I think if you're not sick, it's very hard for you to fully understand how someone who is struggling feels. So I just felt very isolated and alone and just kind of hopeless that no one was going to help me and it was just going to continue to get worse. Mm. And you know, the interesting thing about hormone issues, particularly like thyroid, is that you do look relatively normal from the outside. And so people don't really have an understanding of what is going on. And, you know, the quick misdiagnosis and the quick fix for this is usually sleep meds if people are having a hard time sleeping, and then antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds, and, you know, just because, well, something something else is going on, must be in your head, right? That's oftentimes we what we hear. You know, when I was sick several years ago, I had, I had two different health crises, but I remember when I was younger and I was dealing with horrible chronic migraine pain. I was just constantly told I was going to have to live with it. And it was just heartbreaking. And I'm sure you've heard that from your patients so often when they come into the office. Like my other doctor said, this was just my lot in life. It's so crazy to tell somebody that. Well, I want to talk specifically. I know there are millions of women out there being misdiagnosed as we speak. Lots of women with Hajimoto's, hypothyroid, just thyroid dysfunction and deregulation, along with a lot of other things that are going on with the body. So let's, as we're honing in on what's going on with the thyroid, can you just paint the picture of what you're often seeing with your patients? 
I get patients who come to me who have either not been diagnosed yet or they have been diagnosed and they're not really getting help. So typically the biggest complaint I get is weight gain. Mm-hmm. And no one wants to feel like that. And and this one thing, you know, when you asked me how I felt, you know, it's like people who are gaining weight, they're most if they have a thyroid issue, they're not sitting there and eating enormous amounts of food and laying on the couch all day. They're they're doing their regular exercise routine and then suddenly they're it's not enough anymore. They start to gain weight even though they're doing that. So I think that they're really frustrated and they're starting to feel like, why is this happening? I'm just going to gain more and more weight. And that's a really scary feeling for women, I think. And then, you know, a lot of times they're losing their hair and they're very fatigued and they have a lot of brain fog. Mm -hmm. So they're really not feeling like they're even living in the moment. And, you know, most of my patients have kids and it's hard for them to keep up with their kids and to give the kids, you know, the attention that they need. And they're, they feel, you know, shame and they kind of get depression because of what's going on, you know, because of the way that they feel and like there's no hope. And so either they're looking for a diagnosis and we work on figuring out what they have going on, or they have had a diagnosis of hypothyroid. Most of them don't have the diagnosis of Hashimoto's because people aren't looking for that. And they're basically, if they do get that hypothyroid diagnosis, they're put on typically Synthroid or Levothyroxine, which, you know, is not the best medication in my opinion. And they feel good at first and they think, okay, good. Now I'm going to get back to normal. And then they kind of come back, you know, crashing down into the symptoms that they were having in the first place. So that's kind of the two scenarios that I see coming in. Let's talk a little bit about not even just the, we're talking about the commonality of, of this and how often you're seeing this, but also can we differentiate a little bit about the differences between Hajimoto's and hypothyroid? Because you're absolutely right. People are getting diagnosed so many levels of misdiagnosis here, right? So people are getting diagnosed with hypothyroid, but they don't even look to see if it's an autoimmune condition and if that autoimmune condition is being driven by something else, right? So can you talk a little bit about that too? So when you have hypothyroidism, that isn't actually a problem with the thyroid, you know, making enough thyroid hormone. But when you have Hashimoto's, that is an autoimmune condition. So it's basically an immune system issue, which is just targeting the thyroid. And so you're basically attacking your thyroid gland and depleting the the hormones that way. And so not everyone has that has hypothyroidism has Hashimoto's, but it's very, very high percentage in the 90s. So most of the time it is driven by Hashimoto's because Hashimoto's is the number one cause of hypothyroidism. Mm. And how do we even begin to test for that? And let's talk a little bit about, because what I really want to today is for our my listeners to become a little bit more savvy. This particular podcast is all about becoming the CEO of your own health and having the tools and the information to go to their doctor and say, okay, this is what I need. This is what I'm looking for. So what kind of testing should we be looking for besides the, like I said, most women are having the standard blood test. It's not picking up on what's going on. They're told that they're, it's normal and that there's nothing wrong with them and they're sent on their way. And so what are the types of testing that we should be looking for or that we should be demanding rather? Yeah. So typically you're, if you are given a thyroid panel, you're, get, you're given a TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, and then they'll do a T4 free. Well, T4 is the inactive form of thyroid hormone. So it's really and it kind of goes hand in hand with the TSH. So we really need to be looking, you know, outside of that and looking at T3, which is the usable form of thyroid hormone. So there's T3 for total, and then there's T3 free, which is the most usable form of thyroid hormone. So that's important to know what that is. We want to look at reverse T3. We want to look at T3 uptake. And we want to look at the antibodies, you know, thyroid antibodies, the TPO, and there's thyroid uh, peroxidase antibodies and the antithyroid globulin. So you want to be asking for all of those. And I don't, I still don't understand why, but I can tell you it's very hard for patients to get their doctors to run that full panel. Oh, I know it is. My goodness. 
And I just feel like we just got to continue to keep advocating for ourselves. Or, you know, I always tell people also to just find that functional practitioner who will who will run those tests. And I just want to yeah. give another example. This is something that I see a lot with women when I'm looking at tests and I'm looking at their limited tests is they'll have, you know, sometimes they'll run a, a TPO where they're looking at those thyroid antibodies and they're, they're, everything else is showing up normal except for that, that they have high thyroid antibodies. What are some of the things that you do when you see that? How do you further investigate if a woman is showing up with antibodies, but everything else is looking pretty okay? So that's typically like an earlier stage of Hashimoto's. So then to me, what I want to know is, okay, so what is going on with the immune system? And so the immune system is primarily located in the gut. You know, most of it is about 70%. So then I would look and see what's going on with the gut. You know, do they have leaky gut? Do they have gut infections like candida? Do they have small intestine bacteria overgrowth? And, you know, those are the things that trigger your body to attack the thyroid gland. And in addition to that, it's, you know, inflammation because Hashimoto's is an inflammatory disease. So we want to look and see what are they putting in their diet? You know, what foods are they eating? Are the foods inflammatory, which is making the issue worse? Because the more inflammatory foods they eat, the more they have going on with their gut, the more that they have going on with the adrenals, the worse that that is going to get. And then it's going to start to deplete the thyroid numbers. You know, the, the TSH is going to go up and the T3 and the T4 are going to start to come down. Okay, perfect. I'm so grateful to have you explain that because I know that that is happening for so many people. So we should be looking at the gut. If we see elevated antibodies with the thyroid, we should be looking at what is specifically causing that. And is it usually mostly gut concerns? Could it be stress happening? Are there any other indicators that women should be just looking out for? Usually I find that it's a combination of stress and gut issues, but I know that you, this is what you do. So I was just curious. Yeah. I mean, some people can have five things contributing to it. So I try to be thorough. You know, the gut is always something that I think is extremely important to look at, but not everybody has an issue, a gut issue. So you look at stress, of course, looking and seeing what the adrenals are doing, you know, what's the cortisol like, um, have they had any viruses like Epstein-Barr, you know, Lyme disease or, you know, anything going on like that? Or do they have heavy metal toxicity? You know, there's a lot of different things that can contribute to this for sure. I just wanted to have, you know, as women were thinking about like, what is, what is going on in my life? What's happening with my body? What am I doing? Right. <laughs> That's helping to create this because so often it's, you know, it's a little bit of lifestyle as well when it comes to our thyroid not functioning, honestly, when it comes to hormones overall. Okay. So now that we have a good sense of what could be going on in the body, let's get into the, how do we solve this problem? Right. That's the big thing. People always say, okay, now I've got this problem. I know I've got this problem. I've got, I have a good sense of things. What is the first step? Where do you feel like you can really move the needle when it comes to getting the thyroid back on track? So I start everybody on the plan that's in my book. And the whole reason I wrote this book is because not everyone can afford to work with somebody one-on-one -on -one to go through each and every problem that may be contributing to this. So I wanted to give people something that they could do that I know would make a difference. And so this is where diet comes in. You know, diet makes a huge difference. If you're putting foods that are very toxic and inflammatory into your body every day, you can't expect to get better. So that's number one. I also really encourage people to do liver support. I actually have a supplement that I give people for four weeks that has not only liver support, but it also has a lot of nutrients that support the thyroid, like selenium and iodine and magnesium and B vitamins and all the different nutrients that we need. So I think that that is first and foremost. And if that's all you can do, it is going to make a difference. Other things you can do at home are changing your beauty care products, you know, mm -hmm. stop wearing perfume. And I'm sure you, <laughs> out of all people, <laughs> really have a lot to say about that. You know, stop wearing these things and putting these things on your body that's going to disrupt your hormones. Start using things like essential oils instead. You know, those are things you can do without breaking the bank. 
And then if you want to go further, start doing some testing on your gut and see what's going on there. Get rid of gut infections, you know, support the gut as much as you can. And this is, you know, something we obviously talk about in the book, doing with food as well. Learn stress relieving techniques. And I know people get annoyed when you say, you know, reduce stress because it's clearly not that simple. But there are a lot of different techniques that if you put time and effort into you, they really do work. So I do talk about that as well in the book. And then, you know, if you can work with a functional medicine doctor to dig into these triggers and figure out what is going on, you're going to get the best all around help and you're going to have the best outcome for your thyroid health. And you really should have no reason to get rid of all of your symptoms. And you know, what I love about that statement is it really just provides hope and it feels a lot easier. You know, these diagnoses can feel so scary, you know, can feel like, well, what do I do next? And then I know, you know, for you, you know, I was reading your book and looking at all these recipes that diet plays such a big role. Can we talk a little bit about the diet that's really designed for thyroid and more specifically, too, is there differences with a diet that is designed for healing thyroid specifically or, you know, versus thyroid with an autoimmune component? So without the autoimmune component, you really want to be focusing on foods high in selenium and, you know, foods that are just low inflammatory, um, you know, a lot of vegetables and, you know, there's comes the topic of goitrogens comes up and I, I give a lot of direction about that in the book, but eating fruit, but not too much, just trying to eat real whole food. The big thing with organic food, a lot of people say, you know, it's hard to spend that much money on it, but it's filled with hormones. I mean, if you're eating meat that isn't organic, you're getting hormones that they've injected into these animals and antibiotics, which are going to, of course, affect your own hormones. So I think focusing on just the cleanest types of food you can eat, and I obviously give exact foods I want you to eat in the book, but then when you start getting into autoimmune disease, you know, there is the autoimmune protocol that can be very, very helpful for people. I personally do not start people off on that. I start them off on a low inflammatory diet, but I let them keep eggs and nightshades and limited nuts and seeds, that types of thing in at first. And if they're still not getting results, then we start to remove those things and see what happens. So it's a, it is a little bit different, you know, and of course I do gut supporting foods when there is an autoimmune disease as well. I just want to talk a little bit about some controversy around cruciferous vegetables as well. And then before we get into that, because I'm so curious as, as constantly information is, is changing on that, but are there specific foods when, when you were making these recipes that you absolutely knew you had to have in there? You know, for me, when I'm, when I'm talking to women about eating for their hormones, I have this hormone trifecta, which is lots of good fiber. I usually recommend a pound of veggies every single day. Um, lean proteins, and then healthy fats. Those That's kind of like, you hit those three, you're in good shape. Now, mind you, there's a lot of more details and, and very specific foods within those ranges, but I'd love to hear a little bit about what has been the thing that you want to make sure that you're incorporating into your meal plan when you're, when you're supporting the thyroid. So you want to do foods that it contain healthy fats. Of course, we definitely need that. I'm a big believer in grass-fed and organic meats. People think, you know, you go paleo, you're going to eat, you know, a live cow every day. And it's just not true. I mean, you want to eat maybe three ounces, you know, like at a, at a time. But I really like to incorporate fermented foods for people who can tolerate those. You know, they're they're just so supportive to the gut. And so many people just have gut issues. So it's really important to try to implement that, you know, try implementing bone broth if you can, again, if you can tolerate that. And then, you know, some iodine rich foods, but definitely selenium rich foods, which are eggs have selenium, grass fed beef, chicken, turkey, sardines do. Some people don't like those. And then the healthiest food you can probably eat is organ meats, but not everybody likes those. So I actually did include a recipe, one organ meats recipe that it's literally the best way you can make it flavorful and make it tolerable because there is literally no other food I think is 
nutrient dense as organ meats are. And what was that recipe? Just because I'm I'm curious. I didn't I must have skipped right over that. <laughs> it's like a lightly fried with, you know, I kind of dipped it in coconut and and put bacon in with it as well. So it's coconut coated fried liver with onions and bacon. Okay. Got you it. know, I don't like organ meat. So I don't expect people to just go to town on organ meats, but it is good considering that it's not a very good tasting food. <laughs> Got it. I understand. It makes so much sense. Okay, so let's talk about the the controversy around cruciferous vegetables, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it. So I think that everyone is different. You know, I think you really need to test certain things to see how your body is going to respond. So I do not take away cruciferous vegetables. I think that cooking them makes a difference. And trying and seeing what happens when you eat them. I know plenty of people with thyroid issues and Hashimoto's who can eat tons of them and be completely fine. And they're so full of nutrients that you don't want to just eliminate them from your diet right off the bat. So I actually give a chart in the book with exactly what they are and then kind of give you how you should eat them and set you up with directions on how to do that because you just don't want to miss out on these foods. And some have more goitrogenic effects than others. And like sweet potatoes and cassava are lightly goitrogenic. So I include those plenty of times in the diet. I mean, they're very good carbs that most people tolerate well. And they help you, you know, especially with thyroid issues. I I really find by working with so many people that in order to convert T4 to T3, they really do better with some carbs. And so those are very good choices for carbs. I love that. And yeah, I totally agree. And you know, that's just been the thing I've, I've learned. I mean, especially I think about how nutrient dense those particular foods are. They're bitter in a lot of ways too, which I think are super great for the body, especially the liver and helping to support estrogen levels. So I just wanted to get your take on that because I, I have seen that as well, that oftentimes many people can get away with eating cruciferous vegetables, even if they've got goitrogen properties. That's just been my experience. And it's so, it's so interesting you know, how quickly we'll dismiss a food if we think that there's any potential issue with it. And I'm just like, well, maybe people just don't want to eat Brussels sprouts. (laughs) That must be what it is. (laughs) Yeah. And, And everyone is just so different. And it doesn't matter. Like, I work a lot with histamine intolerance. And I first start people off by taking away the really high histamine foods. But then there's histamine liberating foods and and those types of things that they can tolerate fine, or even some of the highest immune foods they can tolerate fine. So you really want to allow a person to see how their body is affected by something as long as it's really nutrient dense. I don't think it's the same rule when you're talking about gluten, because some people will say, well, I can eat gluten and feel fine. And you may feel fine, but if you have a thyroid issue, it's really one of the worst things you can do. So I'm talking about foods that are high in nutrients. You don't want to just, you know, kick those out of your diet until you know how they're affecting you. I agree. I absolutely agree with that. Now, let's say someone is following all of these recommendations. They're getting on the supplements. They're changing lifestyle, like stress. They're doing their yoga and meditation. They're eating the, a diet that's really supporting their thyroid. And I know that everyone is individual, but I know some, some people really want to understand the light at the end of the tunnel. How long does it normally take where people start to feel, like a woman would begin to feel a shift in changes? Maybe weight starts to finally come off, they feel less brain foggy, and they're getting their energy back. You know, and I know for you, I mean, this was your journey as well. Right. I noticed a change in about 90% of my patients within the first four weeks. And that is exactly why I wrote this book. I wanted people to get that change. And since I've written the book, All of the feedback I have gotten is the same, that people are sending me pictures of their weight loss, they're posting them online, they're telling me how they finally have energy, all this. I get emails every single day, you know, stories, the same story over and over how different they feel. It's not that for everyone because some people, it just goes way deeper. They're chronically ill. They've got a lot of other things contributing, especially when there's viruses involved. 
But I'd say for most people, it's within those first four weeks that they feel a change. Oh, that that is, see, that is hopeful, right? Because we can, every one of us can do something or make some major shifts. And when we start to see the light at the end of the tunnel after, after a month, that is such a big win. You know, and that really is a testament to what we should be looking out for. If we don't see a shift or a change, if we see a plateau after maybe getting other recommendations, maybe we're just thrown on on Synthroid, that we should we should be mindful that if shifts don't happen, if things aren't changing within a month, that we need to do something different. Yeah, definitely. I that's very, very good advice. If if it's not changing if you go through a, you know, a, a drastic diet change, or even if it's not that drastic, but you just start eating what's best for your thyroid and you know, start paying attention to your health and you don't notice a difference, you definitely need to start digging deeper because then there's other things going on like the viruses or the gut issues that need to be handled. Now, I wanted to just lastly ask specifically, are there any, and I think I feel like we've covered this a little bit, but any other things that we should be mindful of, any other triggers that we should be mindful of, even maybe gut triggers that we should be concerned about, anything that we've missed in this conversation today that you feel is really pertinent? Yeah, I mean, for one, stress is the biggest trigger, I think, for everything. So if you are doing all these things to try to get healthy and you're still dealing with something very stressful, it's not likely you're going to fully recover. And it's hard to say quit your job or whatever it is, but you have to try to figure out what you can do to try to manage that. And it's, it's a lot of work. I know it is. So that's number one. Number two is, you know, a lot of people report feeling bloated. I mean, being bloated is a big sign that there's something going on in your gut. Not that you have to have any symptoms for there to be a gut issue, but if you're feeling bloated, especially after you eat certain foods or you're feeling really fatigued or you're just not feeling yourself, you have to look into what the issue is. And I really tell people to, if you know, listen to your body. If, if you're being told there's nothing wrong with you, look with somebody else, like keep digging and keep digging until you find someone who will listen to you and takes you seriously and will work with you and keep working with you until they can figure out what's going on. I think that that is phenomenal advice. And I really appreciate those big triggers. I agree. I mean, I was talking to a friend, Dr. Laura Bryden, and she's got the book, The Period Repair Manual. And we were talking about like, there's no prescription. Like I can't prescribe anything. There's no supplement. That's what she said. There's no supplement for for a stressful lifestyle. Like there's nothing I can do for that. Like you've got to be willing to make those changes. I see that time and time again, like you can't, you can't eat your way out of stress. You can't supplement your way out of stress. You really do got to create those lifestyle changes. Yes. You definitely can't supplement your way out of stress. I've tried. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> me, girl, me too. I'll tell you that. Okay. So let's talk about the book. Let's a little bit about what they're going to get in this book. And then I have one more question for you after that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about where they can find the book and everything as well. Okay. So I wanted to make this book really easy to read colorful, you know, things you can take away and take to your doctor. And so it's exactly what I envisioned, you know, full of charts and really good information that you can really do everything at home yourself and get major changes. So we're go- you're going to learn about the thyroid in the beginning, but it's not going to go on and on and on and on and on and on. It's really just in a nutshell, this is what's going on. And then we talk about the different triggers. So I explain to you what the different triggers are and you know how to kind of know if you have them and what to do about it. And then we go through things like personal care products, which again are so important. And I give you some do-it-yourself recipes for things you can change out, like deodorant, hand soap, all-purpose cleaner, and talk about even makeup and that kind of stuff. I give you an essential oils guide, you know, different things you can do. I love that guide, girl. I love your little essential oils guide. So cool. Just stuff to, to support your body for different things that you have going on. I talk about ways to reduce stress, the ways that you can actually implement and actually are useful different types of exercise that you should be doing at different stages of where you are with all this. 
you know, if you're running, you know, for an hour a day and gaining weight, it's probably not the best thing for you. So I explain all of that and tell you ways to support your body with the proper type of exercise. Talk about sleep, talk about different foods for thyroid health. And then I give you a plan. It's a 30 day plan where you have shopping lists and menus and recipes. And then we go into what to do after. And there's two different roads you can take if you're doing if you're not better, you go down this road. If you are better, you go down this road. And then just, you know, some other fun stuff like, you know, how to store food and how to shop on a budget and all that stuff. I really tried to fit everything I could think of <laughs> into this book. I love it. Well, and where can we get it? You can get it on Amazon. You can get it um, at Barnes and Nobles. There's a lot of local bookstores that have it. You know, if you just Google the name, it comes up on all these different websites. But Amazon is where it's, I believe it's 34% off right now. So most people are getting it from Amazon. Right. Absolutely. That makes sense. Well, I have one more question for you, my dear. And that is, what daily habit or natural solution do you use every single day that really moves the needle for you and your well-being? Like, what is the thing you can't give up? Well, besides diet, because I eat perfect most of the time or else I feel bad, I've really been learning more about meditation lately. And, you know, I think when some people hear that, they think it's a spiritual meditation and it's not. It's really more training your brain and your body to react differently because we can't change people and the way they treat us some, most of the time and what's going on, but we can change our reaction to it. So I've been really focusing on trying to change the way my body reacts to stress and to certain situations. So even just, I do 10 minutes twice a day and it's made a really big difference. Well, I'm so glad. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Becky Campbell, it was such a pleasure having you come on and giving us a lot of clarity around supporting our thyroid, figuring out what's going on with us, and then really laying out a plan in your book to heal us from the inside out. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom. And thanks for having me so much. I'm really excited to be on here. Thank you, honey. See you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. So there you have it, a game plan to support your thyroid health. Now, as I mentioned before, it wasn't that long ago that I was diagnosed with an underactive thyroid, and let me tell you how thrilled I was to get my hands on Dr. Becky Campbell's book. Her recipes are amazing and simple and delicious, and she does a marvelous job at laying out the plan for getting your thyroid back on track. So if you're struggling with thyroid issues or want to make sure that your thyroid is functioning normally, check out her book, The 30-Day Thyroid Reset Plan. I've linked to it in the show notes, or you can just go directly to Amazon. Super easy to find. She's got her beautiful face on the cover, and I know that you're going to love the book as much as I do. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and listening in to the Essentially You podcast. Our next episode is all about increasing intimacy with my favorite sex education expert, Susan Bratton. Now, she is considered the Dear Abby of sex. Susan provides a fresh approach and original ideas to helping millions of people across gender spectrums and all ages to transform their sex drive into passion. So if you're ready to increase your passion with natural solutions and Susan's top secrets, definitely listen in to next week's episode. And as I mentioned earlier on the show, my goal is to continue to spread the word about the Essentially You podcast and to give you a shout out for reaching out to me. So take a moment and review the Essentially You podcast on iTunes. That way I can continue to serve you, shout you out, and help other amazing women become healers in their own home. Well, until the next episode, I hope that you guys are having a wonderful day. Bye.